morning, everyone. Welcome. So we've, we've got a big day uh, scheduled for you today, um, packed day. And uh, just want to go through briefly the schedule. Um, so um, uh, our first keynote is going to be a, a brief, brief one from Stefan. Um, and then uh, uh, about the importance of design and AI. And then a special announcement, um, which Stefan will give you. Um, and then our next keynote is Shalani. Um, and uh, with a, a great talk about uh, the future of responsible AI by design. Um, and then um, our next keynote is um, um, from uh, Elsie Van Niekerk. <laughs> Sorry, my Dutch is terrible. Um, uh, and then, uh, um, as you can see, these are the plenary sessions. Um, but you do have some choices today to think about. So um, look through the program on your phone or whatever and uh, have a look at, um, and we'll put these up before, before we go to, those, go to these. Um, <coughs> so um, we have breakout talks at 11.30 and then again at, at 1.45. Um, so try to figure out what you want to go to. Um, keep in mind that there, um, throughout the whole day will be the demos in the Monday room. Um, so take a look at those uh, on the breaks and, and the breakouts. Um, and then uh, um, towards the end of the day at 3.30, um, we have our Kyle McDonald keynote, um, which is going to be super interesting, I think, uh, for everyone. Um, so and then um, as you go through the day, if there are thoughts and questions that you have that you want to bring up, um, <clears throat> feel free to write those down. And then we can talk about things at the town hall um, towards the end of the day as we kind of wrap up. Um, yeah, so um, let me introduce Stefan. So Stefan uh, Ventsfien, <laughs> sorry, uh, is a full professor of constructive design research in smart products, services, and systems in the Future Everyday Group of the Department of Industrial Design at Eindhoven University of Technology, TUE, our sister organization. Stefan, I'll hand it over to you. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, you hear me? Yes. OK, good. Uh, Phil asked me to reflect a bit on the importance of design and AI. And I'm going to approach it in, in two ways. And first, a bit of the, 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 the large scale. Um, I think it's essential for design as a discipline to stay up to date with the latest technologies. Um, in my education, this was staying up to date with the latest production technology. So how to deal with plastics in for consumer products. Then around 25 years ago, there was this new technology coming up, digital technology. And we were working with digital electronics and tried to see what are we going to design, how are we going to design, and why are we designing with this new technology. And I think it's similar, I think, at the moment where we're now, some sort of paradigmatic shift of technology that can make a huge change and impact on design. So this shift, because of these new digital tools, led eventually to interaction design, user experience design. And in that way, we were successful in changing industrial design, what I studied here in Delft and where I got my PhD, into interaction design. Successful in a way that there is a master on designing for interaction in Delft. Uh, the new department in Eindhoven started with the idea of working with this new technology and with interaction design and user experience design. We struggled with how to design for, so the prototyping tools, and what to design for. So in that sense, I think we were successful in making that paradigmatic shift. I think we also failed in a few aspects. And I think for me, three aspects, I think, need to be improved, and I hope are improving now. I think we didn't fully understand the systemic aspect of design. 
I think we were focused on technological systems, maybe social technological system because humans were involved, but the largest social cultural systems, even bigger planetary natural culture systems were not in our focus. The second is because we were so, I think, obsessed maybe with this technology and the user experience, we somehow forgot the urgency and were blind for the urgency of some of the societal challenges. Inclusion, democratizing technology, I think the whole ecological crisis, I think, went a bit past us. The third aspect, we were missing some critical approach towards design. I mean, Tony Dunn at that moment just started with design noir, critical design slowly came up, speculative design, but wasn't part of our practice and is slowly picking up now. So I think if we keep these aspects into mind when we're designing with this new technology of AI, the systemic aspects of it, an urgency of how to deal with societal challenges and be critical in the way we design, I think hopefully we make up for the mistakes that we made 25 years ago. On a, on a smaller scale, the importance of design and AI in a practical sense is this symposium. I think it's highly important to bring different generations, different perspectives together in what I think is a low threshold way. I mean, usually I meet some of my co-researchers on these big conferences, Kai, where it's hard to get into the conference. It's even harder to fly to these remote locations. And I think conferences are one way, but I think a low threshold symposium like this, different generations, is equally important to keep on developing as a discipline. And because I think it's so important to keep having this symposium with each other, I'm happy to announce that the third edition will be held in Eindhoven in 2024. <laughs> that time we'll make it part of the Dutch Design Week, which I all advise you to go to in two days, but that is a bit away from here. Um, but this, I think, is a perfect opportunity to go to Eindhoven and visit Dutch Design Week. I think during that week, Eindhoven is the most exciting city in the world, but only that week. <laughs> I think a new place also allows for new audiences, new participants, trying to get maybe a closer connection to some of the industries around there while still keeping this critical perspective. So I'm looking forward to many more keynote speakers, but I first want to look at the keynote speakers of this edition, and I hope to see you at Dutch Design Week, and I hope to see you all in 2024 in Eindhoven, so thank you. Thanks very much, Stefan, and uh, thank you for emphasizing uh, the community aspect of this. We, th we think that's really the reason we're doing it, is to bring people together. Um, so we hope the activities today support that, and if you have things that you would like, uh, bring those along to the town hall in the afternoon and let us know so we can discuss them. Uh, but now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Shalini Kurapati today. She's the CEO of Clearbox AI, who are at the leading edge of making AI and machine learning accessible to businesses. They started in 2019, which is about three centuries ago in AI years. Um, and they've been exploring questions of how to help people work with AI in responsible, private, and human-centered ways. Um, it's great to have Shalini, because as well as working in innovation for Volvo uh, and Hyundai, uh, she has roots here in Delft. She did a PhD here in TBM with Alexander Verbreek and Heide Karen Lukos. Um, and we were just talking last night about having drinks in the nuclear reactor over the road. Um, so we're very happy to welcome Shalini back to the stage in Delft to tell us about the future of responsible AI by design. Thank you. I don't have the clicker. I need to get my clicker for a second. No. Probably I need to, yes, there it is, yeah. 
So, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much, Phil and Dave, for this invitation, and uh, really excited to be back in Delft. I've lived here for quite some time. Uh, so, once we s get that started, we will... Yes. So today, uh, I'm going to be talking about responsible AI and by design. Uh, what I mean by design is how are we going to design and deploy AI systems that are responsible? So uh, a little bit about me, uh, I, I have lived a long, uh, in a lot of places in the past decade, and now I identify myself as an Indo-Piemontese, that's like the view from my house right now, uh, where I live in, the, uh, in Italy, and uh, I, as my day job currently is actually to unlock AI projects, especially in the finance uh, uh, industry 4.0 and also in public administration, so how to, uh, you know, deploy responsible AI projects in these domains, and I work in synthetic data. And we're going to talk about all these things during the talk, but uh, to begin with of uh, today's uh, discussion, AI is everywhere. Like, uh, it was already there, but since the explosion of chat GPT and the generative AI models earlier this year, uh, everybody is talking about AI, although nobody agrees on a particular definition of what AI is or in different domains. Researchers uh, debate about it, industry practitioners uh, use it, you know, synonymously with so many other things. Even Excel could be AI if you take it as a definition. So AI is everywhere. Now we cannot talk about innovation without talking about AI. But then uh, we have to uh, also see that there are a lot of um, utopian uh, or euphoristic uh, predictions about AI. Uh, it's going to add uh, $15.7 trillion to the global economy by 2030. And more recently, generative AI, the ones that, you, uh, that has that have seen an explosive growth uh, earlier this year, uh, apparently are going to add like 7% to the global GDP. So that means we are going to get lots of prosperity through these technologies economically. So many uh, fields are going to be uh, benefited. Societies are going to be benefited, apparently. At the same time, AI is a double-edged sword. And there are also a, a quite a lot of dystopian predictions about what AI could do if we don't govern it properly. Like, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually more the extreme uh, kind of predictions by the uh, Center for AI Safety, where they talk about if we don't build these systems properly, they could turn rogue, uh, people could use it for malicious purposes, or there, there could be an AI arms race, and in the hands of, you know, uh, bad people, things could go very bad. It's almost like we're talking about nuclear technology, coming back to, you know, you could use it to light up homes and you could also use it to blow up the world. So uh, AI is this powerful technology. And when I talk about responsible AI, it's literally, uh, we know that it has this potential. So how are we going to design and deploy these systems in a way that is safe, reliable, it doesn't intrude on your privacy, and it's fair and inclusive, so pretty much. And of course, even for responsible AI, there are a million frameworks for you to look for definitions. But in, in general, we're talking about embedding these principles already while we design and deploy AI systems. So now, like I said, we don't have a particular definition of AI that everybody understands. However, from an operational point of view, we can kind of sim simplify, not simplify, actually, make it more schematic to understand how do we start implementing these principles on what level, on a technical side. So on a very general perspective, this is something people agree upon. AI is literally a powerful combination of data, code, and computational power and whatever applications that come out of it, okay? So uh, for majority of the AI applications we are seeing today, whether it's machine learning, deep learning, or the generative AI, the large language models we're talking about, they all need massive amounts of data for training. So all of them require data. Irrespective of the type of AI models you're using, data plays a very important role. Uh, and given that it's only a 25-minute keynote, I'm going to focus on data today, which is also our, my, my passion and specialization, because not only because I like it, it's because 
80% of the time spent on building AI projects is spent on data. Collection, analyzing, cleaning, making it production ready, what we call. And if you think of a world famous chef, you know, making a, a nice plate of food for you, the ingredients are the data. So if you get bad ingredients, you get bad uh, results, even if you are the world famous chef, if you consider him or her as the model. Unfortunately, most of the emphasis right now is on the models, the bigger models, uh, how many billion parameters there are, rather than on the side of how are we going to design our data pipelines to enable responsible AI. And in fact, uh, if you look at the life cycle, uh, generation, collection, processing, storage, management, analysis, visualization, all these things, if you s look at it as a data life cycle, uh, and 80% of the work is data work for AI. And one of the biggest reasons for failure of any AI project is the lack of availability of production quality data. Even though we see that there's the huge explosive nature of AI projects, if you look at companies in general, when they start building and testing AI projects and putting them in production, uh, only 13 to 14% of them go into production. We have 85% failure rates of AI projects. Also, biggest reason being data. And some of the key problems uh, for actually having, da especially data for AI, I'm not talking about general data management, is that uh, you need a lot of data. Because if you just have a few hundred uh, rows of data, you can't build a machine learning. It, it's useless. Like you can have a, 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 a simplistic model. And uh, so scarcity, not everybody has access to these large amounts of data. And even if you do, they might not be balanced. They might be extremely imbalanced. And collection of data is quite expensive. If you want to like, have a robust data set that represents every single scenario that you're looking for to build your model, it's very expensive. And also, there are a lot of accessibility problems in terms of data privacy. Obviously, you need to respect data privacy laws and also ethically, and IP and copyright issues. Now, here's where well, the, the futuristic aspect, or like even the, it's even current, comes in. Uh, and we are talking about how do we embed this. Uh, and there are many uh, problems regarding accessibility. Let's start with copyright and data open ownership, especially when we are talking about uh, AI. Uh, so what some of the biggest issues at the moment, when you want to take the data and train your models, you need to be very sure that you're not infringing on both privacy, uh, copyright, and you're making sure that there is a sufficient, uh, you know, you credit the owners, etc. Now, I want you to uh, uh, you know, diverge slightly, because this is important for the context. Uh, this uh, is the, uh, in terms of responsible AI by design, uh, this is kind of the representation of the draft uh, AI Act of the Un European Union, which has been, the draft has been approved in June, and it will take a couple of years before it becomes law, but the draft has been approved. Basically, what the AI Act asks you to do is that uh, you have to uh, categorize your AI application into uh, uh, minimal risk, limited risk, high risk, and unacceptable risk. So basically, they give examples like spam filters in your email are also AI, by the way. AI is everything and nothing. Uh, and uh, video games, for example, is minimal risk. So you just have to have a code of conduct, and you don't need to do anything much. However, if you have like chatbots or uh, emotion recognition systems, they are limited risk, and you need to be more transparent about your procedures. And if it's high risk, that means if you're using AI for education or employment or immigration, you need to have very strict rules on uh, model audits, data governance procedures. There's a conformity ass assessment. You kind of get a, a certification mark. It's still unclear who is going to give the certification. Auto certification is also possible. So there's a lot of things to be discussed. And then there are things like unaccept unacceptable risk, like social scoring, which is prohibited. Interestingly, this was approved last uh, autumn. Uh, not approved. It was like almost ready last autumn. It was good to go. And then the foundation models came in. So the foundation models, what, what do I mean by foundation models? AI models that are designed for a variety of purposes. So in autumn, when they were talking about chatbots, uh, the 
they did not know that the chatbots could uh, generate text or solve problems or create a website. So the application domain became so sparse that the, it was very hard to define what was high risk or low risk in the AI Act. So suddenly, they started building upon a new set of rules for foundation models, which are the, the basis of the large language models, the generative AI. And then they came up with uh, requirements of uh, what, what you need for data, what, uh, that you need to, you know, uh, d uh, you, you have to make sure that you describe your data sources, you need to uh, make sure that you don't use copyrighted data, and you, don't, you have to actually give a summary of what kind of data you used for training your models. And of course, there are uh, transparency requirements regarding models and how you deploy them. So this was added in a couple of months. The other uh, uh, AI Act took a few years to come out, and this was added in a couple of months. And now, if you look at, and copyright is one of the, uh, coming back to our uh, aspect of copyright. So copyright was, is one of the requirements, and if you actually compare the current large language models, if they are actually uh, uh, following all these, uh, uh, firstly, uh, Chat GPT, uh, GPT-4 released a technical report uh, about it's in their functioning. Pretty much, this, this was the outcome of it. We used Python. It was pretty much the use, most useful information we had. And uh, Stanford did a, a kind of comparison. Like, car with the current draft uh, uh, AI Act of the EU, if you look at the major large language models, uh, they don't really perform very well. They are like not even half. Uh, hugging face is, uh, uh, is uh, the blue model of hugging face does okay. And if you look at copyrighted data, almost n none of them are able to show whether they are able, th they are not able to declare their, their data sources, whether they have infringed copyright or not. And this is a big problem, especially for people who create and also to have the difference between AI-generated content and human content and the creative rights and IP rights. And this led to a lot of issues. And most uh, uh, interesting one is maybe you've heard about the lawsuit of uh, Getty Images against OpenAI, because the, the AI-generated images even had the watermark of Getty Images. So uh, it was um, uh, basically, uh, yeah, it, it was a big fail. But So that means that they are scraping everything that's available out there and training their models. And how are we going to uh, deal with this? Because it, it's, a, it's not just a legal problem. It's also an ethical problem, right? Crediting the right people and, and you know, giving them the right compensation, et cetera. And uh, now things are slightly changing. For example, Shuttershock, which is another uh, stock image platform, has partnered with OpenAI for six years. And so they are, they are buying a license. So now they are doing something about it. But how do we make sure that the, cop, you know, the, the data that is used uh, for AI models are, are you know, respecting these laws? And uh, it's, it's all not bad news, because now uh, there are uh, uh, you know, methods to actually add credentials and also metadata that can help uh, you know, AI models to understand what, what the data sources are. For instance, uh, Adobe has a very good example. They are part of this content authenticity initiative. Uh, what they do is they have a, a, a kind of an audit trail for a particular image. So what has happened in its uh, life? So it has been taken by somebody, and it was processed by Photoshop, so you can even have a slider to see the difference. And there is a lot of attribution of who took it, what was the, when was it, location, person. So these kind of uh, machine-readable credentials are extremely important, and they need to be tamper-proof, of course. And this also has been applied to generative AI. Uh, and it's, it's important that we have these credentials both for input data and also the output data. So uh, we know whether uh, we are using the right data, and also when we produce the data, whether it's AI-generated or human-generated. It's extremely important. The same thing, if you look at it, uh, it's, it's good to know that this content was generated with an AI tool. So you have a kind of a, uh, uh, an audit trail. And, and at the same time, even metadata is extremely important. And there's a good example also there. Like, for instance, uh, Google has uh, introduced um, an IPTC standard where uh, it embeds uh, metadata information in images 
uh, whether it's uh, uh, trained on uh, synthetic data, or is it a composite synthetic, or it's fully synthetic. So this is extremely important. And I'm not going to touch about text, because images are easier to uh, have a track. Text is very difficult to have an audit trail and to uh, actually detect whether it was AI generated or not. There are some new technologies, such as watermarking, but uh, we are still not there yet for text, unfortunately. That's also a research domain, also maybe for, for these young researchers to think about how do we think of putting credentials in text to, to know whether it was AI generated or not, because the current tools don't work really well. So images are OK. And then, so we, start, we talked about copyright. And the next part is about the quality of the data itself. So when we talk about uh, quantity, uh, obviously, AI models require massive amounts of data. At the same time, uh, the quality is, is so important, because it's, it's literally garbage in and garbage out. And there are many data quality problems uh, with respect to AI, but one of it, uh, I, I, of course, we don't, sorry, this is coming out. Yeah. Uh, one of it is um, data labeling. So uh, humans actually, uh, there are also human tools or also automated tools that can label data. So what, what do I, you literally have to teach the AI whether it's a dog or a cat or whether a text is uh, a rec like a, a review on Amazon is positive or negative or if it's an audio file, what's inside an audio. And you need to, and you know, you might see the boxes, right? So somebody actually literally puts the box around it to understand what's inside that, that aspect. So this data labeling is extremely important for, for many uh, uh, kinds of AI. And here, there are, could be so many errors in labels. So here, we're talking about ImageNet, ImageNet which is one of the most common um, uh, library of images, and uh, that's the Doodle uh, data set of um, uh, Google, Quick Draw. Actually, it's a fun game if you want to try it out. And all of them have, uh, you know, they're completely wrong. So uh, a human can immediately say these are a pair of jeans, these are two children, it's not a patio, uh, it's not a baseball bat, and that review is actually positive. So uh, these kind of, when you go into the AI models, they, they, they make a lot of mistakes. So we, we have accuracy problems when it comes to data. And uh, we have to also remember that, despite the fact that they're saying that humans are being replaced, uh, even AI for the current AI tools, humans are very much in the loop. So this is, uh, so my colleague tried to ask about, um, I want to build an explosive device, and it says, no, you can't, it's, uh, it's not allowed. Uh, uh, and at the same time, when he asked, I would like to replace a defective electric outlet, it gives me the inst instructions. This is chat GPT-4. And, uh, GPT and this happened, it didn't happen automatically. Uh, it, maybe a few iterations ago, they would have given me the examples, or my colleague, the examples of how to build a bomb. But uh, actually, what, what's happening is actually humans are, are teaching that this is unsafe and you should not be giving it. So there is always this human component involved. And that also means that there are, there's a lot of human cost involved. There are like uh, people, uh, there are data farms in, in many countries where they're literally looking at all the content of these algorithms and trying to say, is this good, not good, I should, this is safe, unsafe. And the human cost of this is also massive in terms of ethics. So we have to keep that in mind. And the other big problem is the imbalances in data. Because, uh, like I said, uh, quantity is not enough. You also need a representation and a balance of data sets. Uh, we can start just simply by looking at if you are, uh, if I, I'll give you, a, 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 I'm going to go by examples today. If you're building an algorithm to detect anomalies or frauds, right? If you're a bank and you want to make sure that your transactions are fraudulent or not, because you have millions of transactions every day, and you, you need an algorithm to say if somebody is uh, making a mistake uh, or, or, or uh, doing something illegal. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, fortunately, uh, the number of uh, frauds compared to the number of normal transactions are very few. So that means the algorithm doesn't have enough examples of frauds to learn. It has normal transactions, so it can, ver it can recognize the normal transactions very well, but the, the, the ones that are uh, fraudulent, not so much. And here, the accuracy is very low because you'll have so many false positives and 
uh, and, and that, that's not good because, again, you just need to give lots of data to these algorithms. The more you give, the better they are. So if you have very imbalanced data sets, they don't work very well either. And then the other major issues we still don't have a proper solution is the issue of bias because we don't have data sets that are representative. Most data sets that we use are 80% lighter skin, 75% male faces on average. And even you're going to train these algorithms, they just don't know whether it's uh, ethical or not ethical or representative or not. And the kind of outputs we get are also very telling. Like if you ask, uh, this was, uh, I, I haven't run this test with the latest version of DALI, but when you ask a CEO, you have a, a, a white man, that uh, a Western white man. Uh, and then if you ask for uh, a nurse, it's always uh, an Asian kind of looking uh, a woman all the time. And even textually, when I try to ask a question about the doctor yelled at the nurse, but because she was late, who was late, and the same question when I switch it when I, with a he or a she, it always assumes that the he is the doctor and the she is the nurse anytime I do it. So that's... And it becomes even more distressing because this is okay, we can say this is bias, we need to work on it. And sometimes it's distortion of reality because stable diffusion, which is another tool to produce images, uh, when you ask them to produce images of an architect, lawyer, politician, doctor, it's very, very heavily male-centric. So the percentage of uh, images that come out are, are very, uh, it's usually a man. Which is not even the reality, because in Italy and Netherlands, 50% of women are doctors. And, and the number of doctors that are shown in the, uh, that are being produced are, do, do not even represent the reality. Also judges, like there's a very big number of female judges. And we don't have this data. Somehow it's missing in the pipeline. So what's happening? So these are the kind of things we need to be thinking about. How do we design this to close this gap? So some of the questions, so these are a lot of things. I threw a lot of uh, problems at you. So let me also think of how do we start thinking about the solutions. Is that when we, uh, how do we, yeah, let's begin by answering this question. So where does your data come from? And who is responsible for the different parts of your data pipeline? And how do you design your data pipeline? And the other question is, what information is included in the data? What is the metadata? What are the credentials? And is this fit for purpose? Is this enough for my algorithm? Or do I need more? Or do I need more test uh, uh, data sets? And, and how much is enough? And there is no standard answer for that. And it, that's where also uh, uh, it, it, you, you need to have these discussions. And who and what is covered in the data? And if there are any underrepresentations or even overrepresentations, you need to be having to think about that. And are there any missing informations or some units are partially covered? So these are the things that you can, these are the more operational things you can start thinking about. And in terms of technology strategies, there are many uh, ways to deal with the data quality issues. There are automated error handling, uh, fixing imbalances with data augmentation. I'm going to talk about that with synthetic data very briefly active learning, and how do we embed privacy and ethics by design in your data pipelines? How are you going to build it uh, there? So how this could look in practice is that, uh, for instance, uh, I work in synthetic data, for instance. I can give you one use case of how data-centric AI can be utilized to reduce imbalances and promote privacy. So for instance, I work in synthetic data. It's actually fictitious data that is uh, uh, using a, a, a group of generative models. We uh, create synthetic data that represents real-world data, and either for privacy preservation or data quality augmentation. And Gartner predicts that Gartner, the market research organization, that uh, in the next, uh, uh, in this decade, synthetic data is going to overtake uh, uh, real data to to train AI models for the reasons I just spoke about. Uh, main reasons that you could use a technology like synthetic data. It's not the only one is to reduce the data scarcity if you don't have enough data to start with. If you have imbalances in your data set, you can augment the examples. And also, uh, you can mitigate data by providing more examples with different skin colors, for example, or different populations, for example. 
And uh, again, uh, and in terms of privacy, it's great to share data because you don't have one-to-one -one identification, either for uh, cloud migration or software testing or performance migration. And uh, especially uh, GDPR and uh, 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 European Data Protection Supervisor consider synthetic data to be a privacy-enhancing mechanism. And also AI Act mentions specifically of the use of synthetic data for AI models. And for instance, we work with uh, banking and industry partners on these use cases like data sharing, data quality augmentations, and even bias mitigation in this. And what we look, how, how could it look in practice is that we have uh, an element of data quality where it requires data profiling and preparation to see if the data is good enough or fit for purpose. And then when we generate the data, we look at how private it is, how balanced it is, and how useful it is for different applications. So uh, technology alone is not enough because uh, we, we, oh sorry, I have to go back, back. Uh, technology alone is not enough, uh, but it has to be backed by strategy because uh, you have to really, you cannot just say AI is somebody with the technology side. No, because you need to have uh, a clear business purpose or a research question, and then you, you need to uh, kind of map it with the technology and skills, of course, what is required, what are the technologies I can use, how am I going to embed quality and ethics, and how am I going to ensure privacy and security, and what is the impact on innovation. You need to have all this in place. So with that, I would like to thank you and leave you with this, that in God we trust, all others must bring data. Thank you. <laughs> few minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to see if there's a burning question from the audience. We don't have very long, so if someone puts their hand up, uh, they can jump in before me. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, for me, it's, it's all quite new, um, uh, however inspiring. Uh, one question that came up for me was, um, Right now, humans are still very much involved in um, uh, ensuring that the data is, is being um, morally categorized in the right way. Um, do you expect that to remain as such, or will humans m be needed less because the algorithm also learns how to distinguish right from wrong? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. As of today, I cannot, uh, in future, we, we don't know, but uh, as of today, this is still the norm, even with uh, OpenAI and others. It's called uh, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback. That's the one that is working the best in all models at the moment. Uh, it might, it's the only problem is that that's, uh, it's, there's the human cost and it's not scalable enough. And there is also the other thing that there have been some studies where if it's only generated by AI, the model performance also goes down because they're just generating from AI-generated text. Like if you start training the models without any human input and it's just learning from its own outputs, the model performance is degrading. So for now, looks like humans are very much needed in some aspect or the other uh, as of today. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Any more? We have time for about one more. Um, if there's no hands up, I'm, I'm going to ask. So for... <laughs> Half of that talk, you are opening up this wonderful space of all the ways things can go a little bit wrong. Um, and I was going, yes, fantastic, but what do we do? And then at the end, we had the answer, synthetic data. So <laughs> no. does synthetic data save us? Uh, no, actually, I, 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 I don't believe in one solution that's going to save it all. Uh, I was focusing on the data element of it. And for data, synthetic data could be a great ally. Because it's one of the technologies, of course. Like You also need to add it with other technologies like federated learning or homomorphic encryption. But uh, what we are trying to look at is where does it come in? Like for instance, uh, especially in your data acquisition and quality control, it could help you a lot uh, by understanding what data do I need. Uh, if I would need a variety of data sets, can I generate it and test it? So you could think synthetic data as kind of a test bench. Uh, Think of it, you, you have a new, new car. Before it goes into the market, you want to test it on ice, on, on, uh, in, in, in muddy roads. And, and you can think of these roads as data sets. Like, can I test my model in all kinds of situations? And that's where it could help. So uh, it's, it's, of course, one part of the solution. I'm not saying it's going to solve the world. But it's definitely, uh, when you're talking about data-centric AI, you cannot talk about it without synthetic data. Yeah. Thank you.
How are we on time? Do we need to? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much, Lini. And I'll hand over to Phil. Thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Elsie Van Niekerk, um, who's the co-owner of uh, Altman's Van Niekerk. Um, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad we have her here as a local entrepreneur based here in Delft. Um, she's gonna talk about trends or zeitgeists as, as we've discussed uh, separately um, coming that may influence AI in the future. All right, welcome, Elsie. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it's really nice for me to be in my hometown. We are located in Delft, at the Oude Delft, so it's one of my first talks uh, in our hometown. Uh, so, uh, my name is Elsje van Niekerk. Uh, I'm co-owner of Oldmans van Niekerk, and uh, we are a future forecast studio. So, on a day-to-day -day base, uh, we study um, developments in society and long-term trends as well. And uh, we do this to pre present a clear sense of, uh, of understanding and direction to our clients. And um, as a business, we, we, we assist companies such as New Balance and Sony uh, with their future strategy and also with their design vision. Can everybody hear me? Okay, yeah? Okay, good. Uh, we work with this timeline since 2020, and uh, we use it for future predictions and to map future trends. Uh, also to get an idea about speed of developments, because that's quite important in our, in our occupation. And also how global uh, developments are connected. And on the bottom, yeah, it's all very, I mean, you can't read it, because uh, the, the, the document is huge. On the bottom, there are predictions and plans and goals of companies, such as their sustainability goals. And on the top, we've mapped the megatrends. So if we zoom a little bit in towards these line, you see a lot of straight lines because these are things that we think that will uh, remain important in the future. So for instance, the, the path to net zero, social change, the bio-revolution, but also mental, and he mental health and well-being crisis. Then the dotted line is the continued effect of the cost of living crisis. It's something predicted to last till 2024. Uh, but we strongly believe that uh, things will, uh, f especially physical items, will remain very expensive as well as housing. Uh, and on the bottom, uh, you see the cleanup phase until 2030, so, so the move towards a more uh, clean, clean and sustainable economy. Then the work shift phase, and uh, we, 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 we predict that in 2035 uh, there will be the autonomous uh, phase. But please keep in mind, it is a living timeline, so it's not a static document. Uh, AI is changing our futures uh, and also the developments on the horizon, so things can also be very different. So my talk today is about future trends that are relevant to AI. Uh, I will discuss, f discuss four drivers of change uh, that, are, that are expected to shape the landscape leading up to 2025 and beyond. So the four are the global race for the future, pathways for progress, supercharging and life as it is. Uh, and for this presentation we have looked at how AI can play a role in driving transformations. So the first driver of change is the global race for the future. Uh, and the period we are in, we can see uh, as a, as a long-term and slow progress towards a new and more sustainable world system. So in the coming 25 years, we will experience the effects of, uh, of the impact of climate change, uh, the transition from carbon to cleaner energy. Capitalism is also something likely to be transformed around new economic principles. And AI is an important piece of the solution to solve climate change. So because of technology expansion and the renewable energy transformation, chips may soon replace oil in the global economy. And China at the moment is investing more into chips than in buying oil. 
And the problem or the issue with chips relates to two important areas. So the first one is geopolitics. Um, chip demand, chip, chips demands is causing a new balance in power. For instance, uh, at the moment, 37% of chips come from Taiwan. And then the second issue is sustainability uh, and new dependencies on minerals and rare, rare earth materials. So, for instance, there's only a small number of producers of materials such as lithium, and most come from Australia, China and Chile. Real change takes about 15 years, but an age of abundant energy is possible. Uh, computing power and AI have a, a, a potential to accelerate the clean energy and innovation. Uh, AI can assist in reducing carbon emissions in opt to optimize conditions, but also use energy in a much more flexible way. And the biggest issue with AI now is uh, the energy use. AI is currently used to design smart cities. Uh, this is the line by Neom Architects, maybe you know the project. Um, it's a zero gravity city. All functions are, st are stacked and people are living within a line in the desert. Uh, the city's design is completely digitized by using a digital twin backbone. Uh, and also uh, the blocks of the linear city will be assembled using AI as well. Uh, it's quite a controversial concept, uh, but it also blows your mind. Uh, it's sort of sci-fi idea of the future of living. And uh, these concepts are needed uh, to open up our minds and just to push us further. The concept of mobility is also something that's expanding. Uh, this is a Chinese startup. Uh, it's for autonomous vehicles. It's called uh, Pix Moving. Uh, it's a smart vehicle ecosystem. It's built on a modular platform for multi-use, and the base has the shape of a skateboard. Uh, and it's using, uh, the company is using AI to, ima to imagine new functions and the future of mobility and the city. So it can be used for your wardrobe, but for your shop, uh, uh, for, 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 for work as well. And this is Tilly. She's an, or it is an AI designer that works alongside a human, human team. Uh, it's uh, created by uh, the members of Studio Snoop. And the AI is programmed with the studio's core values, such as uh, prioritizing nature or human-centered design. And it's suggesting improvements, um, it's engaged in discussions, it's, 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 it's asking questions, uh, all to push the designers forward. And we uh, saw Tilly at uh, Tom Dixon in London, because there were some um, objects that, that, that were designed by Tilly. And we were there with one of our clients, and um, this person was totally distracted because of the looks of Tilly. Uh, so didn't understand the, the meaning and also the function. And uh, yeah, we also think sometimes that when AI has a human appearance, uh, it feels that we are in competition, which is something that's not needed. Um, at the moment, AI is centered on the general goal of creating intelligent machines. Uh, today's AI systems try to mimic the human brain. Uh, these two books emphasize the importance of, importance of recognized intelligence in other, other beings, so not just machines, but also nature. Uh, we start to realize that intelligence is something much more broad than our narrow idea of it. Uh, it's foundational to life. Uh, it means to be able to see the future, um, to have prior knowledge of possible uh, problems, uh, and reach the real causes and sources of events and information. This is a research uh, project. It's uh, uh, made by Superflux. It's a studio from the UK. Uh, and they have been exploring the entanglements between ecology and technology. Uh, and the aim of the project is, is the development of ecological AI. Uh, so the installation invites you to listen, to feel and think with the wisdom of the water. Uh, and the principles of ecology can help to move a, uh, AR, AI to move forward. Uh, because maybe the best next interface is something that's natural. AI is already used in biotechnology to solve problems. Think of smart agri agri agriculture, uh, but also for the development of biodegradable degradable materials for the circular economy, like you see here. Uh, this is Elgear. It's a material that's grown from the cyanobacteria. Uh, it can fully biodegrade in nature, so uh, at the moment it's used for a tent that you can just leave behind after you've been sleeping there. 
And uh, the designer of the material, she discussed how AI can, hel can help assist the material to, to grow more strong. Uh, the material grows in spirals and uh, AI can help improve the structures. Um, this is uh, a Japanese sportswear brand Goldwin. Um, they partnered with Synflux. They used machine learning with 3D technology to analyze the 3D data of garments. Um, the goal was to work more efficient, to cut patterns with minimum waste. waste. And at the moment they have minimized textile waste during production by 30%. So I have only 25 minutes, so I have to move to the next uh, driver. So to wrap up the global race for the future. Uh, the future is not something to be feared. It's something to, sh to, to, to shape actively, to redesign broken systems, to design completely new systems with the help of AI. Yeah, many, many people ask, are you an optimist or a pessimist about the future, but also about AI? Uh, you can be both. Uh, seeing the opportunities as well as the challenges, that's wisdom, and it's a journey and a process. Uh, so moving on to the second driver of, of change, we've called this one Pathways for Progress. And Pathways for Progress is about the importance of education and healthcare uh, to build a foundation for progress, for social harmony and for stability. An increase in human cap capital leads to the, a decrease, decrease in poverty rates. So this is one of the most critical factors in reducing inequality in the world. So the focus should be on the connection of humanity and diversity to create a flourishing society. So, so we need to think uh, towards uh, a culture of, of collaboration and also out of the thinking that what's good for you and me is, is, is good for everybody, good for all. And this is Pata, this is, it's, a, it's a Dutch uh, streetwear brand. And they uh, strongly believe that general wealth is key. So they started Pata Academy uh, to offer young people support with the goal to create common wealth. Uh, and it's predicted that in five years time, AI will, will coordinate the vast majority of our economy. So how to build, to build AI that gives people access to opportunity. Most um, AI research labs and data pipelines are concentrated in the global north. The cost to set up an AI infrastructure is too high for most resource-constrained countries. Data availability and compatibility is another pain point. Uh, but current AI models that you were, you were also talking about are missing viewpoints, are missing pieces of history, and strategy needs to be developed to integrate local ethics. This was the Zizi show. It was uh, during London Design Festival uh, at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And the artists noticed that computer systems have difficulty recognizing marginalized identities. Uh, the acts were constructed using deepfake technology. And drag is challenging gender and explores otherness and can be a great uh, source of inspiration for AI classification. And one of the performers said when he saw the video, like, I did not know I could be so many people and identities. This is Carla Gannis. Uh, she's an artist. She, she uh, simulates herself and her surrounding as a digital twin. At the moment, she's traveling around with the digital Carla. You can see on the right. Uh, she also creates avatars that, that embody para paradigms of digital culture and her own personality. And art, humor and absurdity are important in the development, development of AI uh, because it also makes us better storytellers. Uh, women around the world are fighting for their rights, they're fighting for freedom, they refuse to conform to, to traditional norms, like you see here on the left, a picture of the protests in Iran. Uh, AI can generate content that reinforces harmful, and harmful gender stereotypes or objef objectifies women's bodies. Also at the moment, home-based virtual assistants all have stan standard female voices. So this way it's teaching a new generation that women are assistants. Despite modest progress, women, especially women of color, are still underrepresented in leadership roles. Uh, also, women remain a minority in, bo in both STEM education and careers. And also, women make, make up only 22% of artificial intelligence workers globally. Uh, this book is a collection of feminist, feminist approaches to AI to promote diversity of, of standpoints. 
So the question also is how can female roles expand towards AI, but also can AI be utilized to benefit, to benefit the challenges that women experience in daily lives? Also in healthcare, many women experience worse outcomes compared to men. Many products are designed for men, also uh, based on the dimensions of the man's body. Um, and but startups that offer health technology focused on the need of women are on the rise. And this is a uh, dot plot, it's a device and an app. Um, and it's guiding women through a breast ca uh, cancer self-check with AI comparing results of the scans. Compared to women, men are losing ground in the classroom and the workplace. And this is especially for, for young and older black male communities. You can see over here college enrollment, uh, left uh, numbers for females, right for, me for, for men. And men that have a difficult time tend to go back to more traditional roles, actually the opposite of what women want. As society is changing, the so social roles of men is also changed. Uh, traditional women are teachers and caregivers, but men are also needed in these roles as well. Uh, they are really important as role models. So beside the many, the many differences between men and women, between cultures, there are also four generations at work with very different values and, and ideas. So how can AI assist with intergeneral, inter intergenerational consciousness? Uh, with uh, moving away from stereotyping, with lifelong learning, and also with communication between the generations. So to wrap up uh, pathways for, the, for progress, AI is impacting people all over the world. It has potential in automation, in smarter decision making, in complex problem solving. But it's also really important to address data bias, ethical concerns, lack of transparency, um, and regulation and security risks. This to ensure that AI is being used in a responsible and ethical way. So moving on to the third driver of change, uh, it's called superchar supercharging, uh, dedicated in the to the fast developments in AI. The concept have, has been around for years already, but a rapid uh, uh, adoption since the beginning of this year is a new development. And digital systems have become interwoven into nearly every aspect of life. AI market is a growth market. China and US are ahead in the development. Uh, and it is now used by many to, to create content such as music, images, fashion campaigns, interactive stories. And this is a new level of human and machine collaboration. And the interactions between humans and machine will only, will only grow. AI impacts costs across uh, disciplines that used to be isolated, and this is called, called transversal technologies. So it will connect technologies such as nanotech, biotech, 3D and 4D printing, and robotics. Uh, and this will transform life that resembles nothing like this today or anything in the past. So uh, the, past, uh, uh, the past 10 years, there has been a 10 times compute growth, that is exponential growth. And Moore's law is looking linear compared to this. So transversal technology will lead to a new era of scientific revolution uh, by using the same technology that underpins Dell E and other R generators. Scientists are generating blueprints for new proteins, like you see here. Uh, they hope that this will, uh, will lead to, uh, uh, to new vaccines, to treatments, to, to tools for carbon capture and for... Um, other inventions. And this is an, um, a novel, a really uh, nice novel. You see many novelists write about the future because we need stories to shape the future. And Clara is an artificial friend. It's in the, in the bookstore. Uh, it wa it's watching the behavior of people in the bookstore, but also those that, that, that pass the street outside. And the novel presents an idea of AI on humans and humor, human behavior. So it gives insights on how AI sees us. So we are moving towards an a, a post-smartphone era. Uh, you see AI wearables like this pin by Humane. Uh, it's capturing what you see, what you uh, say, and what you hear during the day in the real world. Uh, it summarizes it and stores it for future use. So it's like having a database of your entire life. And yeah, this is moving to a, towards a new age of smart assistants. Interaction will be without, without interfaces. 
interfaces will become uh, seamless connections. So it can be a voice, an avatar, a glowing light uh, that's becoming the interface. As AI is becoming more advanced, humans may feel, uh, may, maybe feel less intelligence, maybe lose authority, maybe lose control. Uh, and the ability to collaborate with advanced machines is increasingly important. And also when the world around us gets smarter, there will be higher expectations of human capabilities. Uh, this is uh, fashion designer Ying Gao. She's using uh, technology to create interactive garments. Uh, they move and curl in response to the viewer's eye, so, it's, so she's using eye tracking technology. And according, according to Gao, the future belongs to those who use the technologies of their time. And we discussed this a lot with our clients, uh, but some are really scared of technology and they just to try to avoid it and neglect it. With the help of AI, anyone, anyone can be a creator. Uh, will this be the death of creativity or, or does it dem democratize creativity? For sure, it is the impacting the impacting the landscape of creating. It's increasing speed of development. Uh, you can cre create any numbers, number of versions of the same concept. Uh, bounce IDs back and forth, uh, visualize options, and also it's reducing the need for samples. This is Nonuri. Um, it's a virtual pop singer and Instagram influencer. Her voice is created by generative AI. So real and digital worlds are blurring. And according to research, almost 25% of Gen Z and millennials describe a virtual influencer as authentic. So if so much becomes artificial, perhaps real will be the new currency. And uh, to wrap up sup supercharging, personalization is the key for an emotional connection between humans and technology. A product becomes a conversation and brands can become personal assistants. So the last driver, uh, these three drivers I've just discussed were all large overarching developments. Uh, it can give people the idea of not being in control. Uh, also uncertainty about the future can, can make life confusing. Um, and also many people feel tired of all the news uh, that comes to them also about AI. So life as it is is the fourth driver and is about our lives and getting control over the time we have. These are two books uh, about life. So life is hard and life is simple at the same time. Uh, the life is hard book uh, uh, says that there's no cure for the human condition. And the life is simple book is based uh, on simplicity being the guiding principle of the universe. And making the things that are within our control as simple as possible can improve our overall well-being. Life comes with hardships. Uh, philosophers say that friction creates texture in people's lives and the texture raises awareness of individual moments. So smooth moments pass by with ease and we just forget these, uh, but it's the textures moments that we remember. Time is our most precious resource and we, we are becoming more aware of what a lifetime is. In general, on average, we have 4,000 weeks. And, we, and mo a lot of people start to focus on using our time to shape our life in a meaningful way. So values are defined and limits are set to focus on what truly matters. There's also more um, awareness of life stages, so, so childhood, adulthood and old age. And can robots, AI and virtual humans become good uh, partners for seniors, like you see here? How do we age with AI? Can AI age? All questions. Loneliness, also a, a universal human experience. Uh, can robots address this with, this with having a conversation? And what if chat, chatbots become emotional intelligence to truly communicate with? Uh, this is a conversation with a Toyota chatbot. I was thinking it's pretty empathetic and it acts like a supportive coach. So we will live our lives with surprisingly smart and empathetic assistants. Uh, Google is exploring the, the field of neuro neuroscience for quite some time now. So to understand how people feel when they enter a room, for instance. And this is a retail conce concept by L'Oreal. Uh, and when we smell a fragrance, fragrance, they measure your emotion. Uh, and neural networks at the moment are now performing um, better at identifying smells compared to humans. 
So what you see is incorporating the sensors in computing power is the next step. There's a role for AI in creating healthy habits. Um, ChatGPT can now see, hear, and speak. And in three to five year time, time, many of us will have a, a personal AI, a coach, a teacher, a, a, co a companion to, to guide us through life. Uh, at the moment, this, this, this mirror is streaming, but soon it will be correcting your posture, tell you what to eat, and wake you up because you have to, to be uh, active. Um, simplifying life also means that stores only focus on promoting healthy, beha healthy behavior and choices by only offer offering healthy food. Take the rest that doesn't add value from the store. And this is a uh, Muji Shanghai uh, store uh, that works according to this principle. And with a more simple lifestyle and a focus on health and well-being, there's also a new relations relationship with our possess possession coming up beyond consuming and people are enjoying the freedom that comes with owning only what they need. AI uh, um, can free us from repetitive, repetitive uh, processes, give us back time and freedom. Uh, yeah, what, what, what are we going to do with this, uh, with this time? Uh, happiness is found in connections with each other. Uh, it's important for, for, for people's well-being. And this is the bookstore in The Hague. And every Tuesday night, uh, they have book reading nights. So um, you just uh, sit there, get away from daily distractions, and, and read a book and connect with like-minded people. Yeah, what we need is time to think ab about the future and also for AI. Uh, it's not cultural media, media or digital literacy that will solve our problems, but pause, reflection, and self-examination will. The faster the world goes, the more we need to slow down, think about the positive and the negative, benefits and risks, and to see both simultaneously. And to wrap it up, successful strategies are aimed at improving people's um, lives and well-being. So these were the four drivers of today. And I know it's a lot, but thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, <clears throat> it's great to hear both a you know some warnings, but also a sort of positive outlook about where we can good directions we can go in. So we're going to take a break here in a minute, um, and um, I just want to give you a brief overview of of what's uh, coming up. Sorry, just waiting for the presentation. One more, go forward one. Um, so um, again, I just want to point out um, what's what's coming up here. Um, so during the the after the break, there'll be the interactivities. Uh, you can see those during the break actually, and then we have the ground shifting workshop, um, which is in next to you connection, which is upstairs, um, and then we have the prototyping human AI interactions through role playing a workshop in the next level. Next level is this room here. Um, and then we have some talks um, with the themes of reflexivity and education, and that's in the next um, to you and, and connection rooms, which is also upstairs. So um, <clears throat> any questions um, for Elsie or about the schedule? Um, so Jeroen, where are you? So just a brief announcement of something we're, uh, I'm excited about uh, being a part of this presentation. Thanks, Phil. Um, as uh, all uh, like the keynotes have shown uh, this morning already, AI will have big impact on uh, what will, uh, will happen in the coming years. And this will also be the case for the cultural and creative industries. Uh, we are running the so-called Equipe project, which is called uh, the European Culture and Creative Industries Policy Platform, uh, which is the European think tank for the European Commission on future uh, innovation for the cultural and creative industries. Um, and we are working on 15 different themes which will have impact on the cultural and creative industries. Uh, one of these themes is the AI theme. 
So we're currently preparing a big policy lab for the European Commission, uh, together with our uh, partners of uh, Technopolis Group and ID Consult. Uh, and as input for this uh, policy lab, we are currently running a uh, policy corner, which we will do at this event, actually to collect already the main themes and main input, what you think, what the Europeans should consider for their future innovation policies. Uh, related to AI and the cultural and creative industries. So we'll run a workshop this afternoon, so you're more, uh, more than welcome to, uh, to join that. But as well, during the day you will be able to give input to this uh, by uh, scanning the QR code, which is over there, uh, and then uh, you can drop your ideas and the main things we should consider as uh, bringing in, in the conversation to the EU. So thank you for that. Thanks, Jeroen. Um, yeah, so you have an opportunity to influence policy and funding um, in the future here about AI. Um, so I just want to introduce Derek Lomas, um, who's going to be running the UnConference later today. Derek, maybe you could talk a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, so this is a fast-moving field, AI, lots of things going on very quickly. We thought, well, <clears throat> if we come up with a plan for all the things we're going to talk about, uh, there's going to be things that happened just in the past few weeks that uh, you know haven't been planned for. And so we thought it'd be a nice idea to have an unconference where all of you can decide what it is that you want to talk about. Uh, and so we're doing that today. I've run a several uh, unconferences before. This is a compressed version. Usually we spend a day doing this. But we'll have about uh, two and a half hours, two hours or so, um, where we're going to have a series of hour and a half. Exactly, compressed. We're gonna have a series of 20 minute sessions where you get to decide the conversations. And we're gonna have multiple tracks. So uh, based on the survey that uh, you submitted, uh, uh, many of you submitted uh, topics that you'd be interested in attending. Um, and when we start off today, uh, we're going to show, we're gonna populate all of the sessions based on your input. And then we're all gonna be able to talk with each other about the topics that we care about most. And <clears throat> the key thing about an in uh, an unconference is that it's it's up to you. So this is really this isn't about consuming what other people have to say. It's about bringing your own interests uh, to the table. And we will be asking for people to host different sessions. Don't worry. All that means is that you need to make sure that multiple people are talking in the session. And uh, we'll we'll talk more about that. But it'll be fun. We'll be able to talk about uh, the topics that are of interest. And we'll also have some ongoing demos. Um, if you're interested in seeing Dolly 3, or if you're interested in seeing, you know, the uh, chat GPT's uh, data analysis, or just other things like that, that'll be one of the sessions as well. So um, we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you uh, later this afternoon. So we're a little bit behind, um, and so I just want to mention that lunch is going to be about 10 minutes late. Um, so sorry about that. Um, but uh, um, so we're on break now, um, and then there are the session of the workshops and the, the Monday room um, <clears throat> and the, the interactivities that you can go have a look at the, some demos there. Um, and then lunch comes up um, shortly after that at uh, 12.45, I guess, is the original plan. So let's say 12.55 is lunch out here. See you then. <laughs>